Let them shake their groupthink heads at you. Let them be ashamed of you, embarrassed of you, pissed off at you. They will call you names and you must let them. Let them jeer, let them point, let them laugh. Be resistant to their mockery. Be the fodder for their jokes. Be a magnificent failure in their eyes. A tiger does not lose sleep over the opinion of sheep. Go ahead, be the scar tissue of their worldview, their normality. They will loathe you. They will fear you. They'll wish they were you. That's David Icke speaking to a huge crowd that gathered to see him at Wembley Arena. That is before he was banned from YouTube and Facebook for advocating nonviolence, freedom of speech, free thought, and love your neighbor. Here he is in today's interview on Skeptico talking about science and consciousness. You were one of the first people to really blow the whistle on this fake scientific understanding of consciousness and its insistence that we are biological robots in a meaningless universe and we should accept our empty lives and just get on with it. What you've just described is the foundation to mass human control, without which mass human control cannot happen. Because if you know that you are in your true eye, an expression of consciousness, a point of attention within an infinite uh, flow of consciousness, then there's no way that a handful of psychopaths and uh, idiots, which is basically the combination that runs the world, can impose themselves on your life in the way that you will acquiesce to whatever they tell you. You won't do it because you know you are consciousness. You know you are an infinite expression of consciousness and that will never allow itself to be subjugated and uh, intimidated into submission. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and every year, Time Magazine publishes a list of the world's 100 most influential people. Of course, it's Time Magazine, so it's a farce, but the professed criteria that the editors use is actually quite beautiful. Here's what they write. They claim to look for people that in one way or another embody a breakthrough. They broke the rules, broke the record, broke the silence, broke the boundaries to reveal what we are capable of. Boy, oh boy, today's guest, David Icke, although he's never appeared on that Times list of the world's most 100 influential people, based on those criteria, he certainly should be. He should be one of those people that year after year is on that list. When you look at the amazing achievements of David Icke over his 30-year career, he would certainly fit those criteria. But Instead, we're faced with an Orwellian banning on YouTube and Facebook, but the deep admiration, appreciation, respect of all of us who've benefited so much from truly one of the bravest thinkers of our time. David has a very important new book out called The Answer. We're going to dive into that and hopefully talk about some other things It's just a real pleasure to have you on, David. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Alex. I've got a black shirt on today for one reason. I'm not in mourning. It's the only color that won't show me um, pouring the sweat out uh, because uh, we're going through a uh, a real uh, heat wave in uh, Britain at the moment. And uh, my, uh, my lighting system, is the window. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it's hot in here, but uh, then again, away from it. it's hot hey, in the world at the moment, isn't it? Hey, David, you're rolling out this, this new book. There's a ton of buzz about it. It's, it, 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 it couldn't have been a prophecy. I don't know how you did it, but tell people about the answer, uh, what you're trying to get across, and what's it about? Well, um, you, you talk about you know uh, prophecy, but synchronicity uh, has been remarkable because I started writing the answer in uh, in October 2019, 
And we came up with the title, The Answer, because that's basically uh, what the whole book's about. And we decided a publication date, which is now. Um, and then I wrote 85% of the book and I was just uh, rounding off the end and bang, then came the, uh, the pandemic uh, hoax, uh, as I show in the book, um, totally hoax. And um, I uh, watched over the months that have followed uh, the, the first 85% of the book where I said, this is what the plan is, and this is where they want to take humanity, unfold before me eyes. And uh, that period also gave me the opportunity uh, to take apart the, um, the official, um, quote, virus narrative, uh, which if people were prepared to do their own research, and talk to doctors and virologists and uh, other medical professionals who would never get on CNN or MSNBC or um, the BBC, they would realize um, that uh, this narrative coming out of the World Health Organization and being defended by Silicon Valley and the mainstream media um, is so nonsensical, it's so unsupportable by the facts, and this is the point of the censorship, that the only way you can protect it from being dismantled is by censoring those who are seeking to do that. So this is where the uh, censorship, the hysteria of censorship through Silicon Valley and the mainstream media has come from, particularly Silicon Valley these days. Um, it's not uh, primarily being done because, oh look, look at the power we have. We are gonna censor. They've got no choice. They have no choice but to censor because unless they do, their official narrative will be in pieces on the floor. Can I ask you a couple of questions here? Because yeah. now th this is, man, I am so with you in terms of what you've revealed and what you've told us about the pandemic and how it fits into this overall plan. And you know, you talk about prophetic, it's unbelievable. I, I listened to an interview you gave in 2007 when the swine flu came out. And it's like you're listening to the interview today. So many important, you know, step by step, how they're going to run it, how they're going to do it. And I, let's just give credit to Nicole Marie from the News for the Soul show. If anyone wants to check out that interview, they should. But here's the thing. Here's what concerns me a little bit. David, I've done a ton of debunking of fake science on this show. Yeah. I've been at it for 10 years. You've been at it for a hell of a lot longer because uh, because you just do this stuff and I don't know how you keep your energy up and your work up. But to me, and I hesitate to even say this because in some ways this isn't even central to your thing. But the, when you say, let's get down to specifics. When you say that they've never isolated the virus, yeah. I want to know what you really mean. Because when I look at the science behind it, I think they've isolated the virus. I don't think that's the deal. I think the deal is whether they engineered the virus in the first place and whether they already engineered the vaccine to it, which is well, what you revealed well, in that 2007 interview that Baxter Labs and in, in the in priorly in the prior case, but in the, so I'm sorry, go ahead, please tell me what you think. Okay. Well, well, two things um, on, on the second point, we agree. Um, they have, um, already and i said this in an interview way back even before the lockdown kicked in that um the contents of the vaccine the gates vaccine will already be in place because they're playing the hoax in part to get the uh, the um the vaccine inside every man woman and child on the planet which should people's alarm bells should go on off with that um immediately but on the other side um there is not a scientific paper or a scientific study that has been revealed and i've been saying this and people like dr andrew kaufman in america and others have been saying this for months now that um, isolates the virus as a uh, only in and of itself with no other contamination uh, whatsoever uh, and uh, we've now reached the point where people are um, doing Freedom of Information Act requests, um, uh, asking for um, government agencies to 
reveal any papers that do that, and uh, they they can't. Look, I think that's not even central to the most important part of what you're revealing. But like, here's a paper in Nature, and like when I look at fake science, they don't roll out fake science in Nature usually because oh. there's real labs, there's real people involved. But I mean, here's where they, you know, kind of lay out exactly well, I, I, the. Yeah. So 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 they say. What I would say to people. Um, is to go to the videos of um, of Dr. Andrew Kaufman, uh, who's been on this from the start, and uh, also look at those websites um, that have gone to the studies themselves, they've gone to the scientists themselves, and they've asked the question, did you purify the, this virus? And the answer is always, no. Um, and without that, you cannot uh, say that you had a virus. You have a virus. You've shown that virus exists. And the other thing is, you see, if you have a real virus and you, um, you have a virus that is, quote, deadly, and you have a virus that is um, very uh, sinister in terms of human health, then what you, um, what you don't have to do is tell doctors to put COVID-19 on death certificates all over the world when uh, people have died of other things. And you don't have to um, invoke financial incentives in America to um, get hospitals to diagnose respiratory symptoms as COVID-19 and not something else. What we so, also have is um, the RT-PCR test, which is not testing for a virus. When you've got people like Kerry Mullis, who invented the thing, I've got the Nobel Prize for it, saying that um, these, um, this test uh, should not be used to uh, diagnose infectious disease, and that, that's where the cases are coming from. I mean, you know, you, if people read the answer and the two uh, chapters I've done on this, uh, like I say, quoting um, doctors, virologists, medical professionals, etc., who you'll never see in the mainstream media. They'll see um, the scale of the scam that's gone on. David, I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this because the overall picture that you're painting in terms of the ability to shift the numbers, shift the deaths, shift the testing, all that stuff, I'm totally down with that. All the research I've done confirms that. I just want to know if you're open to the possibility that, you know, you mentioned the, the, the postulate that we can isolate the virus and test the virus. And are you open to the possibility that they have done that just like they did it with the SARS virus? But I mean, virologists, this is what they do all day long. They do it for chickens. They do it for cows. They do it for pigs. And they also do it for human beings. They isolate viruses. They culture them in labs and stuff. First of all, we, we, we can go to and fro uh, on this forever. People should read the answer and look at the evidence put forward there, which is immense. They should go to the uh, videos of Dr. Andrew Kaufman, and they should uh, um, look at um, other people who are challenging this. And you'll see how they explain away this claim to have been isolated. I mean, if you're going back, as many, many people have now, to the original scientists who claim to have isolated and purified the virus, and you're going to those that have produced these papers and you're asking them a simple question, uh, were you dealing with a purified, isolated virus? And they say no. Well, I mean, you know, where do you go from there? But no, you know, I, I hear you, and, and I don't even want to. I don't want to hammer in anymore. Like I said, go to the answer, read the book. There's tons yeah. of stuff on your website as well. It's great. Your time is limited, so you are the man on consciousness. That's been the main focus of this show. Hundreds of interviews with some of the leading consciousness researchers on the frontier of that technology or that science, I should say but you take it at such a deeper level and you connect it in some really important ways that I think are central to, if you will, the answer through all of this. But where I wanted to start on the consciousness question is you really truly were one of the first people 
to really blow the whistle on this fake scientific understanding of consciousness and its insistence that we are biological robots in a meaningless universe and we should accept our empty lives and just get on with it. And I think that is one of the central, central conspiracies to this whole thing. And you've completely deconstructed that and destroyed that from the very beginning. Do you want to talk about science's claim that you are nothing, you are a meaningless robot in a meaningless universe, and how that fits into the overall plan, the overall agenda? Well, two things. Um, first of all, um, if we're talking about, um, quote, COVID-19, I think there is a virus. But it's not a physical virus, it's a mind virus, uh, a, a mind perceptual virus, and it's taken over vast swathes of the human race. And that's what's driving this thing. And on the other, th other side, what you've just described is the foundation to mass human control, without which mass human control cannot happen. Because um, if you know that you are in your true eye, uh, an expression of consciousness, a point of attention within an infinite uh, flow of consciousness, and that your point of attention can be the size of a pea or it can be infinite. It's just uh, how um, open and, and what level of consciousness you want to choose to allow in. Then there's no way that a handful of psychopaths and uh, idiots, which is basically the combination that runs the world, um, can um, impose themselves on your life in the way that you will acquiesce to whatever they tell you. You won't do it because you know you are consciousness. You know you are an infinite expression of consciousness and that will never allow itself to be subjugated and uh, intimidated into submission by, um, by the said psychopaths and, uh, and idiots. So what you have to do if you want mass control, this has been going on for a long time, you have to isolate what I call in the answer, five sense mind, from the infinite level of consciousness. So five sense mind should be an expression of a greater self. But once you isolate that into what I uh, uh, symbolize in the book as a bubble, if you can isolate five sense mind in, in this symbolic bubble, and then within the bubble, feed that isolated uh, mind a sense of reality by controlling the education system all the way through the formative years by controlling the um, the mainstream media the silicon valley media and and so on then you can um, first of all isolate mind from expanded consciousness and then you can program that isolated mind with a sense of reality which is all about little me it's all about self-identification with labels, what I call I am our. I am our man, I am our woman, I am our black, I am our white, I am, I am this sexuality, I am our that sexuality. Um, and, and what you're doing is you're creating a, what I call a phantom self, where you are manipulating five sense mind to perceive its true I, as what it is experiencing, because all those labels I've just reeled off are not who we are, they're, they're what who we are uh, is experiencing. And once you, you um, lose um, the, the understanding of that, now you are at the mercy of those that control the information uh, in society. And we talk about being in the information age and who controls information, it runs everything. Well, there's a simple reason for that. Because from information received comes perceptions formed. And from perceptions formed comes behavior played out. So controlling information overwhelmingly uh, manipulates perception, which then leads to behavior. You control information, you control behavior. David, can you add, because I've heard you talk about this before, and it's been a, a hot button for me. Can you speak more about how science in particular, as we've come to, as we've come to understand it, uh, psychology, biology, neurology, how all that has been wrapped up in what you call this five senses 
kind of bubble and isolate it. And this idea that never will extend beyond that, will never consider the kind of extended consciousness experiences that you had that were so transformative to you that thousands and now millions of people have had and said, hey, I had this near-death experience or I had this out-of-body experience, this shamanic experience, and it totally transformed me. And then we have science as an institution saying, no, that just never happened. It's impossible because you are merely your brain. Yeah. Well, um, if you chart back into the ancient world, um, you had a widespread perception that we are consciousness. They, you know, different names, different uh, descriptions to an extent, but basically there was a widespread um, belief that we are consciousness and that there are other worlds there 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 is an, an infinite um experience but like i said earlier if you have people in that self-identity they become a nightmare to control so what happened is the the global cult as i call it i explain what that is in the in the answer um created mainstream science as it created mainstream medicine through the rockefeller family and the foundation of cult science, shall we say, is basically, can I see it, touch it, say, taste it, hear it? Um, uh, okay, it exists then. And if I can't, then it, it probably doesn't. And what I've just described is exactly what I described a few minutes ago about the five sense mind. Science itself, is an institutional um, expression of the five sense mind. And if therefore um, your only tool is a hammer, every situation looks like a nail and that's what is, has happened with mainstream science. But there's also talking of the, uh, of, of, of the hammer, um, the way these institutions are policed, the way uh, the medical profession with regard to this quote virus is being policed now, I can tell you, I've been talked to enough of them, is by um, the carrot and the stick. That is, if you um, parrot the official narrative, then you'll get letters after your name, you'll get fated, you'll get, uh, your peers are, um, are in awe of you, and you will become a, um, a celebrated scientist, or at least you'll survive in the scientific profession. But as we've seen through um, so long, if you are a maverick, and what is a maverick? It's someone that wants to think outside of the box and go into places that the institutions don't want you to go, because if you do, you might find something out that they don't want the people to know. And so you have this self-policing mechanism whereby you benefit if you sing from the song sheet and you take the consequences if you don't. Um, try getting um, uh, funding if you're challenging human cause climate change. Try getting funding if you are um, singing from the song sheet. No problem. Easy. So this is how it's self-policing. And, and um, so there's a reason for that. And the reason is science in its true um, nature, in its true expression, which is the unbridled pursuit of knowledge, would come across this stuff. I mean, if you go into the quantum physics realm, uh, they're already well along that road. Um, but I mean, I even, you know, you, you even see that, you see that where the, the, the quantum uh, disciplines of science has gone, and you see the, the, much of the rest of science, they have to acknowledge that yes, the quantum physics exists, we can't ignore that. But they crack on with their own discipline as if there is no quantum physics. Well, it's shut up and calculate, you know, yeah. it's shut up about the philosophical implications and, uh, and calculate. Hey, can I shift gears though? Because there's so many topics I want to talk about. You right. just mentioned the cult of science and everything you said there I thought was just so uh, beautiful and there's so many subtleties there that I hope people can pull out of that. 
but the cult word is such an important word. You know, a couple of years ago, you wrote a very important book, The Trigger, that not only provided probably the most complete breakdown of 9-11 act as a part of this control process, but you also connected it to a deeper cultish connection of this Sabbatean Frankish death cult. And this idea that if we can't all be saints, then let's all be sinners, which was the go-to ideology of the Sabbatean Frankist. Can you review that for us and connect it to what you're talking about in the answer? Because I think people really struggle, you know, what you do that no one else does is you connect all these dots. So you just can lay it out on the science side. And now you can, you're going to talk about the cultish death cult and its connection to religion, which is the other, the, the twin pairing of that. And then you can even go, hopefully we'll be able to get to the ET and the UFO phenomena, which everybody always wants to sto you know, stovepipe this stuff and treat them like they're separate. And you're the only guy who can kind of do full spectrum. But talk for a minute about that, that Sabatian Frankist death cult transgression, do the opposite of what the right thing in your heart yeah. is to do, has been this ongoing recurring theme of these folks. Well, um, I, I do talk, uh, I do, uh, talk about the Sabatian Frankist uh, cult in, um, in the answer and, and weave it in with, with, with current events as well as much else. Um, but, um, you know, to, to break this down into a, into a, a simple um, explanation, um, I've been writing for a long time, decades really here, in different, different books at different times, about what I call a mind virus. And when I say mind virus, and I mentioned it already in our chat, I'm not talking about um, the kind of virus that people say is a physical virus. I'm talking about a computer virus or the, the equivalent of a computer virus. And um, it basically works in the human mind in the same way that a computer virus works. So um, if you think of a computer, that's the five sense mind. And then you've got the person on the keyboard with the mouse, that's expanded consciousness. Now, when there's a virus that takes over the computer, um, if it's bad enough, the person on the, um, the keyboard and the, and the mouse is banging away and the computer is not reacting. It's now go gone its own way. Something else has taken over. And I say, and I've been saying for a long, 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 long time, that there is um, a, a consciousness that is in a very distorted state. Um, that, and that distortion makes it malevolent in its intent, which um, attaches to the human mind. It particularly, uh, uh, because it's a, of a frequency in and of itself and not a high frequency either. If you get pulled into low vibrational emotional states like depression and anxiety and fear and um, uh, resentment, hatred, all these low vibrational emotions, then you, you are basically moving your your frequency state into its stadium. Um, a drug uh, taking and stuff like that can pull you into its stadium. And um, what I was um, uh, reading the other day, and I've just got a, a book which I've, I've, I'm quite a way into already, um, was the um, Native American concept of what they call Watiko, which is in the way it's described, and many, many different Native American groups have different names but Watiko is one of them what they're describing is what I've been describing in my books over the years as a like, equivalent to a computer virus and so if you take that symbolism of the computer and the uh, the guy at the keyboard the guy at the keyboard being the symbolic of expanded consciousness what this um, mind virus does is get into that uh, that that, that gap, for want of a word, between the five sense mind and expanded awareness. And it can isolate uh, you in these bubbles that I'm talking about. And the, um, the, whole th the whole thing takes place in the subconscious mind. This mind virus operates in the subconscious mind. The conscious mind 
uh, believes it's making its own decisions and coming to its own um, conclusions and perceptions, but actually they're being fed um, out of the subconscious mind. Uh, and I um, have seen this such a tremendous uh, amount in the last few months where I've seen people who have concluded their perceptions of this, quote, virus situation and what should happen and all the rest of it. And these are my opinions. This is what I think. And then you listen to them and they're simply repeating the official narrative and what uh, which they've taken to be their own perception. And one of the, the concepts of Watiko is that it's a mind blindness which convinces the conscious mind that it's not blind. Thus, people are operating um, in a state of mind blindness while thinking they're not. And it's, it works in the subconscious in the very similar way to subliminal inserts in advertisements, whereby uh, the conscious mind looks in an advertisement and there's a, there's a subliminal insert there, subliminal, um, below threshold, below the threshold of the conscious mind, and it won't see it. But once someone points out the subliminal insert, and this is, I've experienced this, it absolutely happens. From that moment on, the conscious mind, every time it looks at that advert, the first thing it will see will be the subconscious imp uh, um, uh, implant, <laughs> um, insert. And one of the concepts of Watiko is that if the, when the conscious mind becomes aware of this mind virus, when it becomes aware of its influence, that its influence wanes and goes. And for me, a quick way to um, bypass this mind virus, which goes under endless different names in endless different cultures, the same concept, is basically a simple redesignation, reevaluation of self identity. Because while we are self identifying with our labels, what are we self identifying with? with five sense concepts. And thus we're pulled into the five sense realm by our, um, by our perception of, of that being the I. But when you um, reevaluate your self identity from I am my labels to I am the consciousness having the experience called the labels, then immediately your perception of self expands you no longer Ethel on the checkout or Bill at the call center. That's an experience. You are the consciousness, ultimately infinite in nature, that is having that experience. And as you um, expand your self identity, you expand your consciousness. Your consciousness moves into higher frequencies of um, of resonance, and you are you are leaving the realm of what he called the mind virus, the mind blindness. Look, that is outstanding. And there, I want every bit of that in there. But I also want to return you particularly, because there's like a, a number of different plays in the playbook, right? So the Watiko is one, but yeah. and the mind virus is one. But I really think what you tuned into with this Sabbatean Frankist cult of evil, and which is only available to us because of the cult of religion. So we take a cult like the, the Jewish cult, just like the Christian cult, just like all religions take and obfuscate our true relationship to the largest, to the larger consciousness in order to kind of create this control mechanisms. That's what religions do. It doesn't mean that some spirituality can't come through them. But what I think is particularly important that you point out is this idea of transgression, the idea of redemption through sin, the idea that it's best to do the worst. And that will somehow, so that is another, it's almost like a different mind virus that gets played out. But what I thought you did such a beautiful job of explaining is, I think a lot of people have a, a trouble understanding how these folks could do such horrible, horrible things. And I think you really tuned into it there is that they are raising that horror to 
uh, uh, something that they celebrate as being their highest form of their spiritual expression. And as twisted as that might be, they've made that their religion. Do you have any thoughts on any of that? Well, um, I was just going to complete the, um, the, the, the uh, sequence of what I was talking about, which was going to bring me into Sabbatean Frankism, was going to bring me into this global death cult that I expose in the answer. Because having described what he called this, um, this deeply imbalanced, deeply distorted state of consciousness, um, what this death cult is, whether it's the Sabatine Frankist part of it or whether it's um, uh, other expressions and the, the global cult as a, as a whole, it is a completely Watiko controlled state of mind, state of consciousness, state of perception. So when you look at Sabatean Frankism, for instance, um, one of the things it does is invert everything. Um, and what is this distortion, this distorted consciousness that the Native Americans call Wotiko, I call the mind virus, it is a distortion of balanced, love-based reality um, and you know if you look through through history you, you wherever you go whether it's a, a religion or whether it's a, a, a native um, uh, kind of culture you have this constant theme of good versus evil and all that stuff and I would suggest this comes from this distorted consciousness that seeks to manipulate and and assimilate other consciousness into itself uh, and and that which is love that which is balance that which is harmony uh, etc uh, and so you have this mind virus but this cult is its human expression because their whole perception and behavior uh, um, is based on its distortion this is why you, this death cult um, is connected, and I had connected it so many times, to Satanism, to pedophilia, to the banking system, crushing human, uh, human lives, all these things that have gone on, all the things that we'd rather like the world to be rid of, including current events, I would strongly suggest, are actually expressions through this cult of this mind virus and it's seeking to um, manipulate the general population into these low states of emotional frequency i mean look around alex at, at current events what what level of anxiety and fear uh, is coming off people what increasingly i see what what level of hatred is coming off people, all these divisions in society. Um, this is classic expressions of this mind virus. And this cult, which in, in, in its, um, if you like, physical human form, um, is structuring and manipulating human society to generate these low vibrational emotions. So what does that do? It starts to, um, make a, vi a vibrational fusion between this distortion and the increasingly distorted human perceptual uh, states caused by the way that society is manipulated. So the answer, the answer is, is not to find a solution. It's to go the other way, uh, uh, to uh, stop getting um, pulled into these low vibrational emotions because Again, you go back to the Watiko concept, um, the Native Americans and, uh, and others who have different names for the same concept talk about the fact, I've mentioned it already, that once you identify its influence upon you with the conscious mind, it loses its power. Uh, and, you know, when you, uh, you read um, articles by psychologists and and you see various studies that have been done 
uh, and they estimate that 95% of human action, which is usually reaction, is subconscious in nature. You can see that actually the conscious mind um, becomes a spectator to the subconscious mind. And it's in the subconscious that this mind virus operates and thus um, is hidden from the conscious mind. But when it ceases to be hidden, then it loses its power. David, what is part of your daily process, your practice to return to that larger consciousness? I don't do anything. I don't do anything um, except one thing. I always do what I, what I know to be right, what I, what I, what I, I, I feel to be right. So, um, for instance, um, if I um, feel, I know, not least through endless scientific studies, that um, wearing a mask is A, bad for your health, and B, it is actually not about health at all, the masks. It's about subjugation. It's about submission. It's about a symbol of, of um, submission. If I believe that, and I do, if I know, know that to be right here, then I'm not going to wear a mask. And I'm going to, t I, I, whatever the consequences are of that, I, I, well, they'll, they'll have to take their course because I'm doing what I know to be right. If, if you, it, uh, you're in a state where you, you, you feel that, but what are the consequences for me? Uh, <laughs> then Wittiko's got you. So righteous, righteous action is... It's is hard. See, when you open your heart, uh, it's not, you know, the, the love of pure attraction, which is, is associated with the, again, the distortion of what love is. What we call love is innate intelligence. Why? Because it's, it's a, a massive connection to expanded awareness, which is why this cult wants to shut the heart down. My heart aches. My heart is broken. Look at all the associations of heart to states of human perception and states of human emotion. Um, it's not just attraction. It's innate intelligence and something else. It is without that which enslaves humanity more than anything else. It is without fear. Because this knows, it doesn't think, this thinks, it knows that we are um, an expression of infinite awareness that, that is on an infinite journey of explanation of forever, forever. So what is there to fear from that state of self? I, I wrote to somebody today, I said, life starts when fear of death ends. It's one of the great, if not the greatest um, uh, fears, fear of the unknown, which is, it's an expression of. Um, and so this does what it knows to be right. So if you open your heart, first of all, it takes you beyond the Watiko frequency. Watiko can't influence that. It could close the heart and close this heart vortex, but it can't influence what, what this heart vortex in an open state is um, is connecting with because it's out of its frequency range um, and if you um, if you are without fear then you are without intimidation and without intimidation the few cannot possibly control the many w one of the things Alex that's come out of this is um, is putting to bed at least in a, a vast number of new people the idea that I've been told again and again in the last 30 years, a few people can't control the world, but they can because you've just watched it happen. You've just watched billions under house arrest because a tiny few people said that it should happen. Now, how does that happen? It happens because the, the, those um, who are uh, told to submit to it, acquiesce to it. It's a whole, um, uh, sequence of imposition by the few, acquiescence by the many, imposition by the few, acquiescence by the many. Now, when this opens, when you connect with that, what we call love, but that it's that's been so 
uh, discredited as in its real meaning. We have to use things like unconditional love or infinite love to, to try to get anywhere near it. Once that happens, you, you, you're not in fear, thus you're not um, intimidated, thus you will always do what you know to be right. Um, and if enough people did that, then it would be game over because the few can only control the many if the many acquiesce to it. David, you give me chills. I mean, you literally give me chills. It's so eloquent. And now we understand why you fill up Wembley Stadium, why you fill up when you're allowed to travel and be in yeah. other countries, why you speak to thousands and thousands of people, unprecedented, uh, really, for, for someone of in the lane that you're riding in to do that. But I want to return to a question I asked kind of at the beginning, because I think it's also something that people struggle with, people who are spiritually minded struggle with. And that is the action versus being part. Like, I need to just be my spiritual self and evolve my spiritual self versus I need to take action. And sometimes that action might be in conflict ultimately with someone else, even if I don't seek that out. How do you balance that action versus being, the doing versus being part that you, you get what I'm saying in terms of those are common terms, are common questions inside spiritual communities. But your being becomes your doing. Your doing is an expression of your being. And I do find, Alex, and you know, I, I've been on this journey a long time and, and, and I've seen a lot of things and met a lot of people. Um, it, it, the height of what was called the New Age movement, I saw, um, I met some lovely people, but I saw an enormous amount of denial and escapism masquerading as spirituality, whereby um, I'm just working on my being, that being an excuse not to express a doing, because you'd rather not face the consequences of doing it. And so they used to say about, because when I, when I started going around America uh, the, in the early 1990s or mid 1990s, um, I was invited to speak uh, here and there at those um, big whole life expos they used to have. I think it's one out of Los Angeles, one out of San Francisco. And I would be the strange conspiracy guy um, at uh, 10 o'clock at night when everyone had gone home. Um, and they used to say, but what you're saying is negative. And well, two things to that. Uh, uh, they also used to say, um, you, 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 you're getting people to go, go, go into fear. Well, two things. Well, a number of things, never mind two. One, if you are, if you are <clears throat> spiritually kind of open, as you say you are, so wh wh why are you talking about fear? You know, fear should not be affecting you if you're, if you're, if you're really connected. And this is the other point. Um, I used to hear them say, people have to wake up. Yes, but in that case, wouldn't it be a good idea to address what is keeping them asleep? Because if you, if you read my books, Alex, I never cover in a book, the names, dates, places, nature of the conspiracy without doing the, the, uh, going to the spiritual nature of reality. Of course, the two are not um, apart from each other. They are expressions of each other. Uh, and, you know, I don't think myself that we come into this reality as it is to then try to convince ourselves that we haven't. Um, and therefore, we, we, we don't have to go into areas that uh, we'd rather not go into. True spirituality, the great spiritual people of history were not necessarily and overwhelmingly were not those who went to church. They weren't those who, who um, ran some, some coven or cult. They were the ones that actually said, this is not right, and I am going to do what I can to make a difference about it. 
and they didn't call themselves spiritual. They didn't call themselves religious. They just did what they knew to be right. And they're the people that change things because they face head on what needs changing rather than trying to find an excuse not to go there. I'll give you an example, just a quick one. Uh, there, there's someone in, in Britain who uh, kind of claims to be part of the alternative media. Um, but when the masks came in um, for mandatory masks in shops, they said that they had made a decision that they were going to wear a mask in shops uh, because they said they, they didn't want old people to feel unsafe, right? So you're listening to that and you're saying, no, nah. <clears throat> let me just um, translate that. You want an excuse not to um, disobey authority. That's what you, you want. And so you've, you've come up with that. Uh, and, and this is what I mean about finding an excuse not to do what you know to be right. And for me, once you do this, everything changes. Everything, everything changes. Not least because um, as this takes you out there uh, to levels of perception, level of insight, levels of awareness that are not within this bubble, but are well beyond the bubble, you can um, observe this reality from outside this reality. And so instead of within the bubble, everything's random dots, what's going on, you see the picture when you go into this expanded state of awareness. And, you know, I'm not sitting on a mountain like the Buddha saying, look, you know, I've found enlightenment. Um, this is this is our natural state. It's how is, it, is it okay for the Buddha to sit on the mountain? Is it okay for that yogi to sit in the caves in the Himalayas? Is he maybe doing his right action? Because I love what you're saying. I totally, you're so totally congruent in what you're saying. Can people express that differently? Or, or is non-action always but, an excuse? But of, but, of, but of course they can. Um, I mean, uh, you, you can, well, um, but, but then again, you know, when you take the story of, of the Buddha, it, it wasn't about non-action. Sharing um, knowledge is not non-action. It doesn't. Uh, action doesn't have to mean that you you, gra you grab a um, a um, a poster and and go out on the street. In fact, I think that's that's a, a waste of, of 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 effort in so many ways, because um, you know I see um, people. Uh, mistaking in my view i can only come from from where i'm coming from other people have a different view and they're, they're, they're entitled to it the right to it but i see people um going out on protests I, I i'll give you an example we had a protest uh in britain um against the against the government against the establishment right it was an basically an anti-establishment protest and everyone was wearing a mask or vast numbers were wearing a mask so you're going on a protest against the establishment, yeah, and you're wearing a mask. Why? Well, well, because they told us we have to. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. So how does that work out? You know, um, and you go out and you protest. Okay, you've protested and, you know, it makes you feel good. Okay, that's no problem with that. But then what? Um, or you're gonna, we're going to fight the enemy. Oh, yeah. We're going to fight the enemy. We're going to stockpile weapons. We're going to fight them. Um, and yet none of that is necessary. All that is necessary is I'm going to do what I know to be right. And different people will come to different conclusions, but you're doing what you know to be right. Uh, and therefore you're not just in that perceptual state, you are going to express it. It's not just a being, it's a doing. Uh, and Therefore, um, you are um, you are making a massive uh, statement, and collectively, you are making a a transformation of society with a simple one syllable word. No, David. No, uh, no, it's negative. No, it's not negative. No can be an incredibly powerfully positive word you are going to do this because we the few have said you will do it no 
won't do it. No, no panna, no protest, no stockpiling weapons. No, not doing it. Um, and, and whenever thousands of people have refused to acquiesce, re refused to obey, um, the all-powerful state doesn't know what to do with them because the, the, the state power and cult power behind the state depend on human acquiescence. It, 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 um, it depends on people saying, yes, sir, when they really would rather say no, but what are the consequences for me? The heart would never do that. Uh, that's incredible. Two, maybe three more questions, if I can squeeze it in. Sure. One, could you speak to religion? Because many people get offended. They feel like religious beliefs are somehow protected beliefs. And to many other folks, it just looks like a complete another aspect of this social engineering project. It's a way of getting between us and our connection to that ultimate extended consciousness. It takes many forms. It has many of the aspects of control that you've talked about. Speak to religious beliefs and whatever you have to say about that. Well, I'm, I'm, I call it in general, the God program. And we have all these religions, Alex, but when you break it down, when you break the God program down, it, it operates the same, it's a blueprint. And all the different names and different rituals, they kind of obscure the fact that actually it is a very simple blueprint. And you've mentioned part of it there in that, you know, I talk about this Wotiko virus, uh, mind virus wants to get in there, in the spaces or make spaces between the five sense mind and uh, expanded awareness. Well, look at the blueprint of religion. Okay, so what are you? I'm a Christian. What does that mean? Well, I go to church and this man in a frock, women uh, uh, often now, uh, tells me what God wants me to do. Okay, well, that's interesting. And uh, he tells me the consequences of me not doing what God wants me to do. Okay, uh, uh, you? Oh, I'm a Muslim. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I go to the mosque and this man um, in, 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 in a frock, he tells me what God uh, uh, wants me to do and what God will do if I don't do what God says, which is what this man in a frock tells me he says. Okay, you? Oh, I, I, I follow Judaism. What does that mean? Well, I go to the synagogue and this man in a frock, he tells me what God wants me to do and that there'll be hell and damnation if I don't do what he says. Uh, and... Um, and that's, that, 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 that's what Judaism is. And so you go on and you go on and you go on. Um, and what are those people in frocks actually doing, Alex? They're getting in the spaces between the five sense mind and expanded consciousness. They do not want a direct connection. And, and even the word connection is not correct. And it's only a human language because it's not even a connection because what is all one does not connect. It just is. Um, and uh, th what, what happens is that we get a disconnection of influence. Doesn't mean we're not still part of the, the great forever. We always are and always will be. It's that it's not influencing us because of this perceptual isolation, which religion has played a major, major part in. So what you had originally was uh, a, a, a forms of culture that for all their flaws, and there were many, um, they practiced a direct connection with what they perceived as the creator or um, what I call the one. And then religion came in and it, um, created that blueprint and we got the only through this can you get to God only through me only through me um, 
only through believing me and what I say um, can you can you get there. And by the way, um, we're going to give you a a story. We're going to give you a series of rules and regulations. And if you don't follow them, well, you well, you ever stoke the fires of hell? Well, that's where you're going, mate. <laughs> um, and then uh, as the impact of that, and um, what was that? It was a it was a tiny, tiny. Um, perceptual state that's being sold here you can't question it because you're black you're a blasphemer if you do and you're out you're not one of us anymore but as people started to reject that then in came mainstream science and we went from a situation where you can only get to the state of expanded consciousness as i would call it if you do what we tell you because we know what god wants we went to actually there is no state of expanded consciousness there's just you and you come out of nowhere three score years and ten if you're lucky and then you go back into nowhere so and, and now basically you've got these two working uh, simultaneously with the the science through technology and the technocracy that's developing controlled by technocrats not politicians um is is now becoming more and more and more and more dominant uh and there's a common theme i mean just look at the common themes everywhere that this system this cult behind the system is um emphasizing everywhere and that is you you cannot have a direct connection with expanded states of consciousness. You so did have that direct connection. And I wonder if you could tell us how that informed this whole process, because a lot of people go back, they'll look, they'll read in your books, and maybe you wanna mention the books that actually detail you being on the mountain and having that experience, direct experience, personal experience, and then interacting with nature in a strange way that we hear so often, you know, the cloud comes over. I can only tell you how many times I've heard that from other people who've had these shamanic journeys, but you experienced this extended realm. It even changed you in this transformational way where a lot of people struggle reintegrating that and you did for a few months, but then you just explode in terms of your knowledge and what you've been able to bring forth with that. But I also want you to expl explain, if you can, what you learned about the other realms of that extended realm, the, the, in, in particular, maybe some of the darker aspects of it. Can you tie that into it, your direct experience, and where we can learn more about that? Well, I mean, what, what, what happened to me is, um, just very quickly, uh, I was a television presenter with the BBC and a national spokesman for the British Green Party at the time in the 1980s. Um, I had this strange experience uh, over a year where when I was in a room alone, it seemed like there was someone else there that's got more and more tangible, more and more powerful. And eventually I um, spoke out into an empty hotel room. If you're there, would you please contact me because you'll drive me up the wall. And a few days later, not many days, um, I was in a bookstore just down the road from here, still there, not a bookstore so much as a, a news shop, news agent. Uh, and um, I had this experience um, where suddenly my feet uh, were stuck to the ground. Um, I was standing at the entrance, uh, like magnets were pulling them down to the ground. And I had this, it wasn't a voice, it was a thought form, a strong thought form. It said, go and look at the books on the far side. Now, I'm new to all this at the time. This is 30 years ago. Uh, and I'm bewildered of what's going on. And, and I start walking towards the very few books in this shop because it sold tourist things, buckets and spades, newspapers and stuff, very few books. And they were romantic novels overwhelmingly. I knew the shop well. I thought, what, what the hell am I going over here for? But it, something was leading me there. And I got there and there was one book in Among the Romantic Novels and it was a book called Mind to Mind by Betty Shine, who was a professional psychic. I'd never been to a psychic before. But I, I just had a year with this presence around me and which was getting more and more powerful. So I read her book. I went to see her, not telling her anything, except that, you know, maybe her hands on healing might help because I had arthritis. And um, in the three times, three times, four times I went over a period of a month, 
um, she went into psychic mode and said I was going to go out on a world stage and reveal great secrets. And basically, um, she described what has happened in the last 30 years um, in, um, in, in a few minutes. Uh, and then um, I, in a bewildered state, because my life was dramatically changing, my awareness, my perceptions were dramatically changing through 1990 and into early 1991. And suddenly I, um, I had this overwhelming feeling to go to Peru. And uh, I got on a plane to Peru purely, purely on, I, I know, I know I need to go there. You know, this, this intuitive knowing that we have when we open our heart. Uh, and so I went there and lots of amazing things happened. Uh, but I ended up on a, on a, on a hill at a place called Siustani, uh, not far from Puno in uh, near Lake Titicaca. And um, I, 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 was, I was in a, I was in a kind, of, kind of a taxi bus, which I'd hired to take me there. It was out of season. Uh, and as we were driving away, um, I looked at this hill and uh, all I could hear in my head was, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. Uh, and, you know, people will appreciate when this is all new to you, you know, you wonder what the hell's happening to you. So anyway, I said, stop the bus, please, because I'm going up that hill. And I went up the hill. And um, as I was standing there we, uh, under a piercing hot Peruvian sun with no clouds, what um, came through my, through my head was, um, they'll be talking about this 100 years from now. Um, it will be over when you feel the rain, which was a, a ridiculous thing under a, a piercing hot cloudless Peruvian sky but anyway this energy started to go into the top of my head and through my feet and then come the other way and then my arms went out at 45 degrees without any conscious decision to do it and the energy uh, was building up and building up my body started to shake and um and I I was going in and out of consciousness like when you're driving a car and you forget where the last two miles has gone your subconscious has been driving the car thank goodness. And it was a bit like that. And one of these times I came back to, to, to a, a conscious state, I saw that there was um, a light gray mist over the distant mountains. And as I watched it, it happened ever so quick, ridiculously quick, like a, like a, 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 a video um, on, on fast forward. Uh, and um, it got darker and darker. And I thought it's raining over those mountains. And in the next uh, little while, I watched this, uh, well, it was just stair rod rain coming towards me and, and as it got towards me it was straight out of some B movie that no one would ever believe it was a wall of rain coming towards me and um, eventually it hit me and I was soaked in a second and by this time my body is shaking uh, crazy with this energy and um, and soon as the, the the rain hit me the the energy went stopped and now my arms which didn't hurt before agony my legs were like jelly and um my life changed then um i i i came back to england um concepts and things uh, insights were pouring into my conscious mind far far too many to process and um it was like pressing too many keys on the computer. The computer froze, couldn't process it. Uh, and I went through three months of um, almost not knowing my name, not quite that, but, but you get the point. I didn't know where I was, what I was doing, what was happening to me. And then um, it was like the computer unfroze after about three months and it happened very quickly. The, the, the unfreezing happened very quickly and suddenly I am who I was before but not people who um who I met were saying well I, th I thought you're supposed to have gone crazy there because it was in all the media I'd gone mad because I was a television presenter at the time or uh, in that period um they said um they said you've gone mad you're, you're the you're the Dave I've always known and I kind of was outwardly like I am now, but uh, I saw the world completely differently. Instead of, instead of seeing the dots, I saw, I saw how they connected. Um, I, I, I would see 
what was really being said as opposed to what the words said. And what I what happened was um, my life became this synchronistic journey of meeting people, running into um, experiences, coming across documents and books and stuff. And it was it was like some force was handing me puzzle pieces in the to put into the the picture. And uh, you know I've got a, a stream of books here. Uh, a lot of them are very considerable because they cover so many interconnected subjects. And I would never have been able to produce those books if um, I was um, just using my conscious mind and there wasn't some other force that was, it was like walking through a maze, Alex, and someone was opening and shutting the doors. Uh, uh, so you went in the right direction without that. And that was coming from some other level. Uh, then you, 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 you couldn't be done because what, what is what is being uncovered and what i uncover in the answer um does not want to be uncovered and without support from other levels of uh, consciousness reality whatever you want to call them you couldn't possibly have unraveled it um and it is you know i mean it's taken 30 years as it, as it is but without that um without that uh, that that support that um guidance uh you couldn't be done david final question the new book, The Answer, that is out just now, it's just coming out today or tomorrow, I think, as, as we speak here. What does it have to say about a topic you've covered uh, more thoroughly and before anyone really was on it? Again, I mean, it's like a repeating story about our connection to the U UFO ET phenomenon, and in particular, I wanted to hone in on a couple of points. You know, in the last couple of years here in the United States, the Department of Defense has taken hold of that narrative, has co-opted, have spun it into this political, in my opinion, what is a political psyop disclosure. And it has very much of a, this is a national defense issue. So we have that on one hand, that's almost like a parallel of what you're talking about, how we have science and religion each, each sandwiching us in to disrupt our understanding of the consciousness. Here we have the good ET, bad ET, and we have both narratives existing at the same time where the DOD is continuing to spin the uh, ET is going to, it's a national defense issue, so give us all the power to go and deal with it. And then at the same time, we have folks in the UF. O community, the ET experiencer community, are saying, no, these are actually bringers of spiritual transformation, and it's a good ET, and they're trying to protect our environment. And so in the process of, if you can, covering all that, I also want you to touch on the fact that we are almost certainly looking at many, many species with many, many agendas, with many from different places. So you know, we can't automatically just say ET either, can we? So I know I laid a lot on the table there, but oh, well, if anyone can handle it, you can. Where do, where do you start? Well, I, I come from that angle um, from uh, a different point of view. Um, uh, just after the turn of the millennium, uh, I I'd thought about it before, but just after the turn of the millennium, I concluded that we live in some kind of virtual reality um, well, Matrix, uh, to use the na uh, name in the movies, but a, a virtual reality, um, which was part of the disconnecting of uh, our perception of reality from uh, the greater reality. And um, when, um, when, I, when I was a kid in, 19, in the 1950s, uh, my father had no interest in astronomy before this incident or afterwards. And I'm still bewildered about what the heck happened. Um, we had no money. We never went anywhere because we had no money. And one day, it would have been about 1958, 59. Uh, my father walked down the stairs one morning um, and said, we're going to London. And uh, I was shocked because I'd never been to London. It was a long time before I'd go again. And what, 1958, 59, I would be six or seven. 
we're going to London. And I remember we went on a steam train um, and my father said, we're going to the planetarium. Right? Now, I didn't know what a planetarium was. I were not bothered. I just, want, I, I just wanted to go to London. I'd heard about it or so much about it. So we go on this steam train to London. We go to a planetarium, which I, I know the date because it had just opened. It opened in 1958 in London, next to Madame Tussauds in London, in Baker Street. And um, so I didn't know what to expect. So we walk into this planetarium and I, I sit down at the seat. I don't know what to expect. And then suddenly uh, the roof, the ceiling, dome ceiling, became the night sky. And it must have been about midday that we were sitting there. And I looked at it and something hit me that never left me. That even at that early age, that could be the night sky. It looked like the, it was midnight and the roof had come off. And that never left me. And um, when all this started for me that I've just described, um, I, I looked up, up at the sky one day and, and it appeared to me as a gigantic dome, like something out of the Truman Show, you know. Uh, and that all came back to me when I started to um, go down this road of uh, this is some kind of holographic projection. And this comes into your question because of course, we know about this whole concept of the, was it the Fermi paradox of how there can be so many planets and so many stars, and yet the amount of conscious ET activity is ridiculously little compared with that potential out there. And for me, um, the the lack of et activity on the against the potential of it is part of isolating human perception you imagine if there was um there were uh other races what we call ets um interacting with the earth you imagine what would happen to human perception it would be dramatically different we would be getting access to tremendously different perceptions of reality, perceptions of possibility, how to look at life, how to look at this, and how to look at everything. We would be in a, a completely different knowledge base. But if you can isolate or perceptually isolate people to the point where there is no out there, or perceived to be no out there, certainly no conscious interaction then you can isolate this bubble again and you can control what you can control the information that the target population receives which leads to its perception which leads to its behavior and i'm not saying not for a second and, and i wouldn't because don't believe it's true that um uh, what we call ets can't come into this um projected reality both malevolent and um, but the other kind. But um, it's my feeling that this, this, this reality, uh, this astronomical reality is not teeming with life as you would probably expect it to be. Because if it was, the ability to control would not be a tiny fraction of what it is be impossible in fact there'll be too many sources of other information and um i see this one planet this one green from a human physiological point of view inhabitable planet which according to mainstream science anyway compared with the projected size of the universe is about a billionth of a pinhead and then I see all this, all this uh, other potential for life, uh, planets, stars, etc., that appear to not uh, certainly within 
within the frequency band of human sight not to be inhabited. And it makes no sense to me whatsoever that a planet so small should have this phenomenally beautiful environment, very unique environment, and then you look out and there's nothing else certainly within interaction range that's anything like it. So you've got humanity, many people within humanity do actually believe that there is nothing out there. And it's a, another part of this isolation. And um, I, I wonder what it is that we're looking at when we look at the night sky. Because that experience when I was six or seven years old in the planetarium hit me so powerfully, I never forgot it. Basically, well, if I can see the night sky on the top of a ceiling, then what is the night sky? Um, and, and I'm still thinking like that now. Uh, and um, so I'm like, like everything in all reality, there, there are uh, benevolent expressions of all that is, and there are, shall we say, Watiko infested expressions uh, of all that is. But I just wonder what this, what this night sky really is, what this space that we perceive really is and whether it is what we think it is, or actually just a holographic perception, which would, uh, a projection rather, which would, um, which to our senses would seem incredibly real as it does. Our guest again has been David Icke, truly, as I said at the beginning, one of the bravest, I would say one of the, one of the most important thinkers of our time. He's never going to make it on that Times list of one of the top 100 most influential. Thank God, Alex. Thank God. <laughs> Be sure to check out this new book, The Answer. And hopefully it's an entry point, if you haven't, to checking out his other books. I think Trigger is super duper important book if you haven't looked at that. But his website is fantastic, too. I'm a member. Many, many videos, blog posts, valuable stuff, well, well worth it, iconic.com. And we have to support, even more, we have to support this kind of work because part of the process is to put this boa constrictor stranglehold and gradually try and cut off the money that this important research deserves. So David, truly, truly wonderful having you on. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we started Iconic, uh, which now is about 750 videos and um, uh, series and podcasts and full length feature films because we could see this uh, we could see this severe censorship coming and we wanted a, a place where this could be available. And uh, some great news. Uh, I think it's great news anyway. Um, uh, we've just uh, licensed um, Vax, you know, the movie Vax. Oh yeah, uh, right. Yeah, yeah, about vaccinations, which there was a big controversy with De Niro's um, film premiere. If you remember, uh, we we we've licensed that. So um, it, that that's on um, uh, iconic very soon. And the only place you can see it streamed. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to offer. If anyone's stuck around this long, I'm gonna purchase for you, for listeners, ten copies of the answer. Okay, and I'll assign those randomly for every 10th person that that gets to me. Okay, so the first 100 that email me every 10 ones will, will receive a copy of the answer compliments of the show because it's so, so important. And I hope when you receive that, the one thing I'd ask is that you do check out Iconic and at least sign up for a month and see if it doesn't provide the kind of value that I'm talking about. Okay, so just email me. And I'll be honest about it. Every 10th one, I'll give you a copy of the answer with the hope that you'll check out Iconic. So, David, thanks again. Good luck yep. with the rollout of this and all the terrific work that you're doing. Real pleasure, Alex. Really lovely talking to you. Thanks again to David Icke for joining me today on Skeptico. 
I'm probably going to be diving further into this topic because I'm not so certain about some of the science he's referring to. But again, as I tried to make clear in the interview, the overall lay of the land that he's describing is so incredibly on target and way, way too close to the truth. I mean, scary close to the truth. So I guess that is the question to tee up from this interview, and that is, what do you take from David Icke's view of the COVID-19 pandemic, and what do you leave behind? Love to hear your thoughts. They will inform me. They will drive me. They will direct me in how I move with this. So please let me know what you're thinking. And thanks as usual so much for joining me and for being a part of this. I have some good ones coming up. I did slip David Icke in here ahead of some other ones. <laughs> I have some ones that are going to be really delayed, but that's okay. Uh, they'll all get out there and the book will get out there too and it'll all work out just the way it's supposed to. Until next time, take care and bye for now.